Hi everybody, my name is Greg Henniger. I am a member of the community team and I'm joined by Scott Lane, the game director. And we heard you loud and clear that you liked the last one and so we're here to do another dev update video. We're gonna try our best to keep it a little bit shorter this time but still go into what you're interested in. Um, we're also gonna be talking more about current news, things that is coming you know, in the near future. So some of those topics might be you know, January, we're gonna deep dive into January. Uh, the PTR, what you can expect, um, how we use it on our team. February is really uh, about bugs and polish. We're going to deep dive into that. Then we're going to have Dave V back on to talk about weapon balance and uh, future things coming to the weapons. And at the end of the show, we're going to have questions from you, the community, and from our creators. Yeah, and you might notice we're unmasked, and I just want to make sure everyone uh, is clear that we take COVID very seriously. Everyone you see today will have been tested within the last 24 hours and cleared to be here. I also want to echo what Greg touched on. The last video came out a lot longer than we wanted, <laughs> so we're going to yeah. do everything we can to keep this thing to 45 minutes or less. We will try. We will definitely try. Yeah. Um, we just uh, were extending the winter convergence event. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, when we were, you know, over the break, we noticed that people were responding in a really good way to it, and we yeah. thought that it. A lot of people didn't get the opportunity to play over the break, mm -hmm. so we thought we'd leave it running an extra two weeks to give more people the chance to experience it and play it. Nice. Uh, so did you jump in? Did it change your play style at all? Yeah, you know, it had a really positive effect on me, probably one of the reasons I wanted to extend it. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, you, when, you, when you get to the higher levels of the game, the mid to end game, um, you don't really go through those starter zones. You find yourself just kind of fast traveling around them. Right. This got me running through, and, and they actually felt different, you know, seeing the lost presence on the ground. Mm -hmm. And if you just happen to be lucky enough to see a, you know, a Gleamite meteor come in, it's like it was a wow moment. It felt really cool. And uh, even, the, even the winter festivals, going over to, the, to those locations and getting those special rewards, it just created a lot of, like, fun and reminded me how cool the world is and how easy it is to get lost in the world. So I really liked that. You know, yeah, cool. yeah, I loved the like Aurora Borealis that was in the sky and it kind of just gave New World this fresh paint. Um, so if you guys haven't checked it out, you should definitely jump in. So this is gonna be a great episode and uh, let's get started. Yeah, we're super excited. All right, and now we are joined by Mike Willette, the world experience lead and Dave Verifayi, the creative director. Yeah. So this first question is going to be for you, Dave. Um, what are some of the main features that we're going to be able to expect coming in January? Uh, there's two main features we're releasing with January. The first is obviously mutators. We talked about it a little bit last time. Yep. Uh, mutators are a way to sort of enhance and make the expedition experience even more challenging, right? So there's 10 difficulty levels that players sort of climb through uh, over time. And as they do that, not only do the enemies get harder, but we add new challenges like the curses. Uh, and what we're seeing in PTR is that, you know, we release the first set uh, of mutators, right? There's a rotation that they go through. Mm -hmm. uh, so those will change every week and bring new challenges and the dungeons that are being mutated will change. So it's a way to sort of increase the challenge of, of expeditions and also sort of continue to add variety over time as we sort of shuffle the schedule and shuffle which expeditions are being mutated. Nice. Uh, Mike, is there anything uh, that might not be considered a main feature like mutators uh, that we should still be excited about coming to January? Yeah, absolutely. So because you know mutators are, are being released, we want players to be able to get to those locations quicker. Mm -hmm. So we've added six additional spirit shrines throughout uh, a turnum. So a lot of those are going to be co-located next to obviously which expeditions are getting mutations, but also towards the end game content like arenas. So look for those. In addition to that, we've reduced the cost of fast travel so right. it won't cost right. as much as right. off. Okay um, and this one's for you Dave. Uh -huh. So why did we decide to introduce a new resource instead of just increasing the gear score? I know a lot of people are talking about that. Yeah, that's a great question and that sort of gets to the the second main feature we released here which is the umbral upgrade system. Mm. So uh, players will be upgrading their gear via umbral materials and we did that then rather than just sort of introduce gear that goes to 625 organically in the world and that we didn't want to invalidate all the gear that people have acquired already, right? So people that have acquired their really cool 600 Legendary, yeah. uh, or even now we've you know announced the, the 590 cool gear, uh, can use Umbral to upgrade. So they can sort of continue to invest in what they've acquired already and, and sort of build the power of that rather than have to go out and get to completely new gear. So I think it's a, a sort of a cool new pattern and it creates another cool resource. 
uh, that players can get through, you know, mainly mutators, mm -hmm. uh, but also through the gypsum casts and crafting. So we're trying to integrate a lot of different ways to get this resource into the game. Is it going to uh, affect the expert expertise system at all? Uh, yeah, so it's a great question. So expertise is, we're raising the cap of expertise to 625, and we're sort of integrating the expertise and gypsum together. So as you use gypsum to uh, increase your gear after 600, each point uh, upgrade that you get will also increase your expertise. So that's how you'll increase your expertise past 600. Uh, previous to 600 will be the current means, uh, the gypsum cast, mm -hmm. the bumps you get in the world, uh, things like that. But after that, it'll be the umbral system. Okay, awesome. And I, I know a lot of people have been uh, talking about this next question, so of course I'm going to give it to you, Mike. Oh, yeah, uh, me. Yeah, you're, <laughs> we're welcome. Why did we decide to rely on tuning orbs for mutated expeditions as well? So uh, we needed a method of control uh, of access, basically because we want to make the rewards uh, very valuable to players. So we want to make sure that uh, your time investment is equal to the reward that you're going after. So that, that was the initial impetus for that system. Uh, so in January, we're going to allow players to also purchase them in the faction shop and craft them. And so that's one of the bigger differences. And we're going to monitor through the PTR and play sessions, like what is that rate? Does it need to you know, increase or decrease based upon play patterns and basically feedback from the community and what we're seeing in, in the actual data? So we're going to look forward to seeing how all that stuff plays out. And so by the time this is released, we might have already gotten data because <laughs> we're you know, weeks in the past now for the viewers. Yeah, I mean, I just want to add to that. I think you know, in the past, I think we were probably a little too strict on our gating, yeah. right? And I think this is the first step in sort of loosening that with adding access to the faction shop. And we'll be continuing to look at it. And I think, uh, you know, make sure we hit a balance that feels good for everyone. And something else to note is that we're going to, to make uh, the vanilla expeditions, those keys available in the faction shop as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be a big difference. And then once you've actually uh, defeated the vanilla version of the expedition, uh, you'll receive the codex for going into the mutation, uh, sorry, the mutated versions yeah. of those expeditions. And those keys are universal, so you can use any mutated orb cool. in any mutated expedition. Okay. All right. So I know when we look at like the PTR and stuff, we we also look at the forums. We look at you know anecdotal evidence, but uh, looking at data and how players are interacting um, directly in game is really important to us as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's not just one vector that we gain. You know, our 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 knowledge of like how the game is being ingested, and, like how players are. are are going about like you know defeating things. So mm -hmm. we're going to try to look at like what were their gear score values for when they cleared certain difficulties. Right. Like uh, which mutations are ab obscenely hard mm -hmm. and for what given reason. So there's so much scale that we can do internally, and then we get a lot more data once we have a lot more people playing. And so we're starting to see pretty awesome patterns in in uh, Lazarus and Garnet Genesis and Dynasty. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Absolutely. Now we are joined by Katie Kaczynski, uh, the senior producer. Um, so we'll, I know we talked a little bit about it in this last segment, yes. uh, talking about the PTR, but what have we learned so far in the January release, uh, things that we found off the PTR? So uh, one of the big things that, that we kind of touched upon in, in our last segment was just the frequency of mutator orbs and how you get them, and that's something that's like high on our list to just you know keep aware of and monitor like usage and playthroughs and completion times, things like that. Uh, next thing we're looking at is, and this was some feedback that came in that we're examining, is like how can we get lower level expeditions mutated? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's a really good question. The things that we're dealing with are like, hey, does it have like the same like you know length of time of experience? Also, does it have the same number of bosses, same number of chests? So it's things that we need to like you know equate to like see if there's value there. So that's another thing that we're exploring. Uh, one of the other big things that we found, and including in our own playthroughs and PTRs, oh, yeah. some of the named enemies coupled with some of the mutations are really hard, <laughs> <laughs> right. very difficult. So that's something that uh, we're modifying and, and we'll continue to balance as we get feedback and see data. Yeah, are you, are you going to want to try to keep some of them on the higher, higher level just to... Uh, like get the people who really want to go after the super tough stuff. It depends if it's a if it's a good strategy. Like uh -huh. meaning like oh there's a mechanic around this and it's something that players can overcome or use tactics to like uh, defeat. Um, but if it's just straight up broken, then yeah, that's a problem. Right. So 
it, it, we there's a fine line between fun and right. Please kill me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, one thing I wanted to add, I think another piece of feedback we got uh, on the umbral system during PTR is that requiring items to be gear score 600 to use umbral to upgrade them was a bit onerous. Like people said, hey, these are really hard to get. Sometimes you get bad luck and you've been chasing for one for a long time. And if you don't have them, it feels like you're locked out of the system. Uh, and I think, you know, we do want to make legendaries very valuable, but we hear that feedback and totally understand it. So one of the things we're looking into now is reducing that uh, minimum requirement from 600 to 590. And I think uh, that'll be great. It'll allow people to take the really good, you know, because sometimes you get two great perks and it's like, ah, I didn't get that third, but it's still a really strong five, you know, 590, 595. This will allow you to upgrade that to 600 and then from there take it all the way to 625. Uh, with the umbral system, so I think I think that's be a change that seems to be uh, exciting to players. Mm. Nice. So speaking of things that we've uh, are learning in the current PTR, is there anything that we learned from past PTRs that really helped you know improve yeah. uh, the PTR when right now and PTRs going forward? Yeah, I think the the biggest things we learned is you've got to make sure players can test uh, what you're giving, right? So, yeah. so make sure the backstories, those are the things where you choose the character. It has all the right equipment and it has all the things you need. Make sure the uh, uh, crafting stations are at tier five. Uh, unlock all the fast travel points, give A's off. Make sure players can test. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing we learned is that the more we can provide patch notes about what all the changes are in the PTR, the more players can test that. And, uh, you know, I know the patch notes weren't fully complete again no, this time. they uh, were not. <laughs> so, yeah, and that, honestly, that was, a, that was a tough decision to make because the patch notes weren't done. Yep. So when we we had the holiday, we had just the way that we, um, we moved those fixes through our branches, um, we didn't have the notes in a good spot at the time that we needed to start the PTR so that we could get the right amount of testing on that build. So we were like, let's just let's just put out these patch notes that are incomplete. We'll let folks know that they're not complete and we'll, we'll continuously update them to get more of the information in. And by not complete, it meant that like, there were things in the PTR that we just hadn't had the time to put into the notes yet because that is, again, like we talked about in the, the last dev stream, there's there's a lot that goes into it, mm -hmm. so um, so yeah. So we posted it because we wanted folks to have that that first like this is the stuff that we fixed. This is what we did. There's more coming, and <laughs> it was a mix of thank you for this and just utter outrage because <laughs> right. right. they thought that we had made like stealth changes and we were like no, we just were behind and we're getting them out. So they've been they've been updated since and mm -hmm. they'll continue to be updated throughout the PTR. So yeah. the lesson learned there is that we need to get as many of the notes, even if they're not in like the best form, we right. just need to get them out to the players when they start the PTR. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so that was a miss this time. We did better than we did the last time. Mm -hmm. So we're incrementally getting better, uh, but it definitely wasn't in the shape that we wanted it right. this last time. But so. some people took it as a challenge to like scavenger <laughs> hunt and find the, yeah. the specific things. So yeah, speaking yeah. of the PTR, um, can you talk about the PTR to come out for February and when we should expect PTR releases compared to monthly releases? Yeah, so um, there there is a PTR for February. So the interesting thing about February, in case folks are not aware, is that February is just a like bug fix month. There's right. no major content that's coming with. Uh, the February release. Mm -hmm. um, we have some things that we're focusing on for that to make sure that we, we get a good amount of fixes in and we make a, a real difference for the players that have been asking for, for things for a long time um, that we've had we've had the opportunity to work on. It's just that they haven't had the testing that they need for us to feel safe to put them out into the wild. So as far as when we start a PTR, we want to give ourselves enough time to react. Mm -hmm. So there's not a specific time frame, t time frame that we're going to be um, pushing on a PTR. But we definitely want to give ourselves at least two and a half weeks, um, generally longer, before we do a, a release that we would want that to be in PTR. We learned the first PTR when we gave ourselves like seven days. Right. <laughs> that, right. that was, we we're like, we'll just do scale testing, we'll check to make sure that like the servers can handle it, and then we're good. 
And what we found out was that we were not good. <laughs> we were the opposite of good. Players felt like um, we lost their trust and we felt like we lost their trust. So we've been gaining it back since then. And so we want to continue to do that um, by providing the PTRs far enough in advance mm -hmm. that we can listen to them, take their advice and, and find out what the biggest sticking points are and address those before things get released into the live game. Yeah. Now I know that like the, the dev team likes to jump into the live game and interact with yeah. players there and you know read chat and see what you know the finger on the pulse of the live service. Do you guys jump into um, PTR? Oh yes. You're in there <laughs> constantly. Oh yes. Uh -huh. uh, it was pretty visible the last time. <laughs> oh really? Um, yeah, we actually we ran our. Uh, some people may have seen our Merc Guard run that was done in the PTR uh, last month. And then we also um, had scheduled some days where usually we have internal play tests for the, n the next release. So right. we'll have something for the PTR. Um, we want our players to tell us what's going on with that because we've already tested it internally with our smaller group. So we want them to kind of focus internally on future stuff. Well, last time we were like, you know, everybody into the PTR, pile in, let's see what's going on. This is a big release. We have a lot coming up. We want to get this tested. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> players noticed because <laughs> we have some like, we have some amazing folks on our team who are, have been level 60 for forever. Right. Like they, are like the tried and true, and then you have very casual people, uh, <laughs> and we just kind of walked into some situations that maybe we shouldn't have walked into because, you know, we're like, oh, I can solo this like at level 60 elite area, why not? I was like, I'm level 60, I can go to Cutlass Keys and solo these level 40 elites. No, <laughs> <laughs> nice. cannot, not a chance. So yeah, so we jump in and we'll join. It might not be noticeable because you have to have a specific build that calls you out with like, um, different UI and chat, mm -hmm. but they join for sure. So we just won't tell you who we are. <laughs> yeah. It's a secret. Shh. All right. Awesome. Thanks. And now we have Katie and Scott back at the table, but now we're joined by Scott Geyser, the senior gameplay engineer. Um, this first question is for you, Katie. Can you give us a little more insight when we're going to see the next round of server transfers being available? I know uh, everyone's talking about it. <laughs> everyone wants to know. Yeah, um, I want to know too. Just kidding. So um, we we did less than ideal merges in December. So we had this grand plan to merge all of the worlds that were struggling into um, a world that would would be good, right? So it's either that means that either it's multiple worlds struggling into one world, and because of their populations and the the um, the type of populations that they had that one world would now be um, what we consider healthy. Or it was a low population world into an already um, healthy uh, server. So those were our two that we were working with most often. Unfortunately, or fortunately actually, right before we were going to do those, like literally the night before we were going to announce, we discovered this housing persistence issue which would have been really awful if that had gone out into the live world. Mm -hmm. And if we had um, merged worlds, it would have been really bad. And we don't want to do that. So um, we had to fix this housing persistence issue, which is being fixed and being tested. And it's coming out soon. Mm -hmm. um, and then once that's done, we need to complete that first round of merges. We're calling it Merge 1.5. So that so we had round one in December. <laughs> round 1.5 will be right after we fix the housing persistence issue, which we'll let folks know in the forums, like, hey, this is done. This is completed. I know that there's a lot of threads on it, but there's like an official post from community. Right. Um, so on that post, we'll let folks know that it's been done and that we're going to move forward with round 1.5 of those merges. Once those are done, um, then we can open up character transfers again. So the merges are done by us. We merge worlds together. Um, we call the, the final world a destination world, and the other worlds are our source, source worlds. Mm -hmm. um, character transfers are initiated by the player. So those are not full worlds moving over, and they, they go by a separate but somewhat similar set of rules. Um, and those have also been put on hold um, because of the housing persistence issue, because okay. you bring your house with right. you, right? So until that was fixed, we couldn't do the rest of this. And we were planning to open the character. This is like, so. there's so much here. This is so much planning. <laughs> it's a domino so effect, it's, yeah. It's like, like what we had wanted in a perfect world was that all these, tr all these merges would have been done mid in December. And then right after that, we can open up the character transfer so that after you've soaked in the world and seen whether or not this is the right world after merge for you and your company, mm -hmm. if you decide to go somewhere else, then you have 
have this token and you can go where, where you would like to go, like whichever world you're going to have the most fun playing on. Um, because of the persistence issue, all those plans got moved back. Um, so once we're done with uh, 1.5, the round 1.5 of merges, then we will open up the second round of character transfer tokens for the player initiated Okay, ones. so it's going to be a second token and not just the first token people may have been sitting on. And yeah. I, think, I think the high level takeaway is this is hugely important to us. Yeah. Both transfers and merges yeah. are a high, huge priority. But we're not going to break things trying to get them rushed in. So they're going to happen soon. Yeah. And that's about as uh, exact as we can get right now. <laughs> yeah. But they're, 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 we're, we're, we're actively working on it. OK, yeah. awesome. Yeah, I know the community is like, you know, knocking down our door for that answer. So hopefully yeah. we'll get that out. Um, another thing people are knocking down our door for answers on is uh, kind of the status of some of the major bugs. Scott, do you have uh, do you have that in your back pocket? Yeah. So, um, you know, all the different gameplay teams have uh, their own priority list of bugs, and you know, we try and take care of uh, the biggest ones first. Uh, you know, for this next update, we've you know we've closed hundreds of bugs. Uh, some of the the big notable highlight ones. Uh, I know I saw a lot of videos of people drowning on land right. on, uh, yep. on YouTube, so that that should be fixed. Um, there was an issue blocking. Uh, uh, if you swap back to your original faction, you couldn't progress to get to the, the top rank anymore. Um, so that will be fixed. And then I know another uh, hot button issue is uh, the void gauntlet uh, sliding and the, uh, the animation canceling on the bow mm -hmm. to fire way faster than, than you're really supposed to. Uh, so th those will be uh, in the upcoming fixes as well. As well. Um, Scott didn't mention the weapon swap issue that there's been a lot of concerns about, mm -hmm. primarily because that's not really a bug. Mm -hmm. We're going to go deep on that in a little bit with Dave Hall as well as the weapon desync issue. We're going to have an update on that. Uh, there are a few more fixes, though, that we can talk about. We have the Outpost Rush. Uh, one, there's a bunch of fixes in Outpost Rush, but the one that people have been complaining about is the Brute uh, Meatball the attack meatball. is happening a little too often. <laughs> yeah. So we're reducing that. And, and then be, um, it'll be more expensive to get the Brute as well. Yeah, yeah. it'll be exactly it'll be more expensive to get them. And then also we have the uh, housing tax change. So. Before we had the housing tax, everyone felt, everyone, the players felt it was too high. Yeah. We've given a huge reduction in cost in that for, through, the, through the holiday time. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to come back and put the cost uh, where we think it is, and it's not going to be as high as it was, and it's not going to be as low as it's been discounted to. We think it's going to be a happy median that works for everybody. Okay. I know we talked about it uh, a lot in the last previous uh, you know, dev update video, really like dug deep into um, exploits, you know, duplication bugs, bans. Mm -hmm. um, what has happened between you know, that video and today? Yeah, so uh, there's been a lot going on uh, in that regard. Um, you know, it's one of the team's biggest priorities. Obviously, like the health of the, the game economies is, is kind of like central to, to our game, so we need to do whatever we can to protect that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's a lot of different teams are contributing there, like the customer service team. Uh, they're uh, changing some of their workflows to make it quicker for them to respond to reports from players about bots and, and things that you see in the game, uh, as well as like gold seller spam. So, um, you know, player reports are a huge part of how we're able to, to combat, combat these things. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that it's super helpful. And reducing the amount of time from when the report's uh, sent to when customer service rep is like looking at it and investigating it uh, makes a huge difference. Also, um, like I said in the, in the last update, like we don't just use the reports. We also have to correlate that with telemetry because we don't want reports to be weaponized right. against players and things like that. Exactly. Um, so we've done a lot of work in getting that telemetry data uh, more easily accessible to a customer service so that uh, when they do get a report, they can say like, oh, and this, this player has already like triggered these alarms or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we can action them quicker as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, we've, uh, we're always invest investigating um, bots and different bot programs. And uh, we work with our partners at uh, Easy Anti-Cheat mm -hmm. so that um, they can identify signatures for some of these things. And uh, EAC can handle uh, identifying and banning uh, machines that are using these bot programs as well. And so I think since the last time we talked, I think maybe about 9,000 or so uh, bot accounts have been actioned on. Awesome. Um, yeah, and then uh, I think maybe about 600 more just that uh, were running programs maybe we haven't identified, but that we've, we've banned as well just through investigation. Yeah, has the PTR um, been helpful in, in finding some of these things, you know, feedback from the community um, and reports from the PTR? Not for bots specifically, but for exploits for sure. Great. 
Yeah, yeah for sure. I've gotten um, quite a few messages on the forums, um, direct messages, please do not post <laughs> publicly about exploits. <laughs> Please. Please. Um, so I've gotten a lot of messages, and so have some of the other developers and community managers um, informing us of things that people are able to exploit on the PTR. So we've been able to address that before it's gone live and become a bigger problem for folks. Um, so that's been, that has been great. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, looking forward a little bit, what are some of the bug fixes um, we're going to look for in February? Are there like specific ones people should be aware of? ones that may have taken a little bit longer that we're now finally getting into uh, to February? Yeah, for sure. So there's there's a lot of bug fixes. There's not there's not really one that's outstanding because right. this isn't this isn't a major feature update. We're not making those like big, big content changes. Um, but we do have some some bug fixing verticals that we're focusing on. So the two that are near and dear to me um, that I know that the team is working on is they're doing a full pass on missing ingredients and recipes, um, mats, and searchability in the trading post for those items. They're doing a full pass on that. Um, and then also perks and abilities. Mm. So bug fixing on those, which I know is going to be really fun and exciting for the players to finally like not have to get to me on the forums and tell me about how wrong these things are. Um, I know that like we are listening for sure. Um, it just is these things are, are really big. And sometimes they touch a lot of different files. And it's dangerous for us to put into the smaller updates. Um, so yeah, so we've been working on those. Those are two that are near and dear to me, although there's definitely more verticals that we're looking into. Yeah, another one that's important to me is uh, throughout development, when you add stuff to the game, you sometimes break existing stuff. And this is manifested in ways that frustrate me through missions and quests not being completable. So we have a goal to fix every one of those. So we're going to go through, hey, the quest marker is taking you to the wrong spot, or the drop isn't happening, or in some cases, we've broken something like in a the housing quest line, or the faction quest line, yeah. the faction changing quest line, I meant. Um, to have all of those, to make sure that those are all bulletproof as well. Like, like this period of February, it's exciting because, you know, there are often different people making features than fixing bugs, but to get that pure focus on bugs at this point is really exciting. Nice. And we know that people want it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think it's going to be really great. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for coming, guys. Thanks. Thanks. All right, and uh, now we're joined by Dave Verifayi again. Uh, but we have another Dave at the table, uh, Dave Hall, the player experience lead. So this question is going to be for you first. Um, the Great Axe, the Rapier, the Fire Staff, the Ice Gauntlet, these weapons probably have the most discussion threads in the forums with players thinking that they're too weak, other players thinking they're too strong. You know, How does the team feel about that? That's a great question. Yeah, we have a, a lot of feedback on these weapons and we're constantly looking at it. And I think we feel like we're getting to a place that's very close. Um, and we are going to be making some changes to these weapons, but they're going to be minor. So there's no major issues coming up with us. Uh, we don't feel like there's any major changes coming down the pipe for these. So we want to make sure we, like, we're going to be doing slight balances to them um, and moving from there. Is that something uh, people will be able to experience on the PTR? Maybe coming up. Uh, in. Maybe up in the in the future months. It's not going to be on the current PTR. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be mm -hmm. probably on the next PTR. Yeah, I mean, I think every every PTR we try to introduce a couple balance changes. And like Dave said, I think you know we're getting close. You know, balance is super hard, especially in a game like ours where there's so many different types of play. Right, like there's solo PVE, group PVE. There's you know a small combat. Then mm -hmm. there's war. Like there's so many different modes. It's hard to get the balance perfect. Right. So. Uh, but I think we're at the stage where we're going to be making smaller changes, letting them percolate, right? Like sometimes the small changes have way broader impacts uh, than, you, than you think about in terms of the meta. So uh, there are some changes coming, but they're going to be smaller in nature, and we're going to be keeping our eye on it. Okay. Uh, things that have small you know, impacts, um, do you have an update on the desync issue? I do, yes. Uh, so we have a strike team now uh, formed around the desync issues, and we're, we already just put out something in our weekly, which I think came out uh, well, by the time the video comes out, we'll be, yeah. we'll be live. We're um, living in the past, right? Yes. Now. <laughs> uh, 
And so we already got one major change in there and we have a, a, a lot of uh, smaller changes coming in on the desync issues, but it is our top priority right now. We have uh, a, a strike team associated with it. Awesome, yeah. sounds good. Yeah, I mean, just real quick on that. I think it's important for players to realize it's there's not like a desync issue, right? That's like causing everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bunch of different little changes that have caused the, you know, the server and the client to sort of be mismatched. And, and they've got a team now focused on this and they're going through them one by one. They're trying to fix the most onerous ones first, the worst ones, and then go down the list. But it's going to take a while to get them all out, but uh, I think you know it is a focus now and they're working on the, the big ones up front. Awesome, yeah, it sounds like uh, people are investigating. We're, we're hyper looking into it. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, Dave V, uh -huh. is there anything you can share about the future of combat that uh, people might not know about yet? Uh, not too much more than we talked about last time. I think, you know, uh, bugs and balance are a big issue for us still and a big focus for us still. So, you know, the desync issue, and I think Dave may be talking about weapon swapping next. Some of those big bugs around combat are a high priority for us. So that is taking a lot of the focus of the team. Uh, balance we're going to continue to looking at. So those are some of the big focuses. Uh, on top of that, weapons are still a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. We are working on, and I think we talked about it last time, Blunderbuss is, yep. is, is going to be the next mm -hmm. weapon we're yep. releasing. Uh, we're, we're heavily working on that. We're playing it a lot internally in the team. It's super fun. Uh, definitely brings a new play style to ranged weapons. So uh, we're working on that on future weapons. So that's the main focus of the team right now. Yeah, Scott uh, brought it up a little bit earlier, but uh, what are we doing about the weapon swap delay that some players are experiencing? So in our next PTR, we're going to actually have an update for the players to try out. Um, we have a uh, back tick check on our weapon swap now that's going to really help with uh, the confirmation that you have done a swap, basically. So when you hit that button, you're going to know that swap is going to occur, and it's going to be much more reliable than it has been in the past. It is important to note, though, that we do not have instant cancels in for our swaps. Uh, that is a big, a big topic for us and something we're not ready to tackle at the moment. It's uh, quite a game changer if we did that right now. So uh, you will still have to wait for the windows for the weapon swap, but it will be queued up correctly now. Okay, perfect. Thanks cool. for the update on combat, guys. For this last segment, um, you know, we answered a lot of questions earlier in the show and all the other segments. We were scouring the forums, we were scouring Reddit, social media. So it was from, you know, directly from the mouths of our community. And so for this last segment, um, I, I want to throw some grab bag, you know, questions from some of our content creators who are, you know, playing our game uh, a lot. So this first question is going to be for you, Scott. All right, so are there any plans for expanding content in the open world, such as random incursions or events or dynamic events, stuff of that nature? Yeah, you know, unfortunately I can't get specific, but I think I've said a few times and I'll say it again is, the more dynamic the world is, the better it is for us. When you go to, when you revisit places in the world, we want it to feel different and to feel new and fresh and exciting. So this is something we're gonna carry on a, a lot going forward and you can expect to see future updates to have to, to completely support open world gameplay, more dynamic gameplay, for sure. Okay, great. Uh, Dave, this one is for you. Uh, can you talk about the philosophy of bumping gear score so soon? Yeah, so the reason we're bumping the gear score now is really to tie in with mutators, right? Like those two features are very well paired. We wanted people to climb the difficulty ranks and increase their gear score as they were doing it. Uh, and features like mutators take a long time to build, right? Like it's a complex feature that, you know, involves a lot of the game. So we, we sort of made this decision based on information a long time ago, and we thought this would be the right decision, you know, to increase gear score and have mutators coming out now. You know, I think if we were making that decision today, I think we see other priorities like some of the bugs uh, and other things that we would focus on, and we might not make that decision today. But mm -hmm. just because it's tied with mutators and we really wanted to get that feature to players, that's why it's happening. Yeah. I, Anticipating what players want before your game is out in the wild isn't always the easiest thing in the world. Right. Um, we have huge conviction around mutators, you know, as a long-term, healthy, really strong feature for New World. Um, but in hindsight, maybe it is a little earlier than it, than it could have been. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. This one's for you. Uh, are there any planned changes or like major overhauls coming to War and Invasion? How does the team feel about their current state? Uh, yeah, you know, as a developer, you're never happy with your feature. You always want to make it better. So I think we have a lot of things that will be coming down the pipe, smaller, mainly for these ones. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, our top priorities are war declaration and uh, some of the war performance. Uh, there's definitely some issues there that we, we've been trying to get better over the time. Um, it's getting a little bit better. We still have a long way to go, though, I think. Yeah, and I think longer term, um, no commitment to time or anything here, but 
We'd love to see casual versions of each of those to get more players the opportunity to try, you know, some of our backup box features like Warren Invasion. I mm -hmm. think that'd be really cool. And it's, I have a lot of fun playing them, so I'd like to get more people in there. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Dave, uh -huh. uh, the new PvP missions on paper looked great. Uh, but in reality are some of the more mundane features of the game, considering it's one of the core features. Um, can you, uh, ex can we expect some improvement uh, in the PvP missions or? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think the changes to the PvP missions, like the actual missions themselves, I do like them better. They're focused more on the actual PvP activity rather than just doing things while flagged. So I think that is an improvement. Uh, but yeah, the, the whole process of flipping a territory uh, you know, is a little cumbersome. And a certain part of that is by design, right? Like, we don't want that to be super, super easy that you can just flip on a whim. Uh, a whim, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, I, I can understand the feedback here. Uh, this is something we're looking at. I, you know, it's not an immediate priority on something that we're going to be jumping on, uh, but we're going to keep our eyes on it. Okay. Um, and the open world, the environment of New World is, is really what makes it fantastic. Um, you know, this person said they'd love to see an arena built into the side of a cliff or a coliseum similar PvP area where people can like watch other people fighting inside. Um, can we, you know, expect to see some small scale PvP arenas with like maybe matchmaking systems? This is for anybody that wants to answer. Yeah, I think uh, just to start off, I think our small scale PvP is one of the best parts of our game. It really shines our combat when we're when we're playing that. Uh, and it's something we absolutely want to support. And uh, we do have some things coming down the pipe. I don't know if anybody Go a little further. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty early to talk about them, but I think, right. you know, uh, arenas is something that we're looking into. I think if we do it, uh, or when we do it, it will, you know, likely be in a phased approach, right? Like we, you know, we will release an early version of it that may not be as fully featured and will mm -hmm. continue to grow it over time. Iterated on the PTR, yep. that type of stuff, with as, players, as we, like yep. with all other new features that we yep. might introduce. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. Like, I would like to be in a, you know, a fixed where I know it, it's like 3v3 or 5v5 or whatever the numbers are, PvP experience, because it very rarely ends up that way when you're playing in the open world. So yeah. uh, I think it'd be exciting. And uh, you can't hide in a 3v3. So right. Like what we see you know, happening in the open world right now, people will create a giant circle and make a, a fight club yeah. of sorts and bracket and all of that stuff. Uh, so it's, it's, it's exciting to see it already happening and that, uh, and that we're noticing it. Um, all right. Well, that's great. Thanks for the answers, guys. Thanks. All right, we covered a lot today, and I think uh, there was some good information that we got out there. Um, last time you guys did a run of the Merc Guard uh, area, are you going to be doing another run for the community? Yeah, last night our World Experience team did a playthrough of the Dynasty Shipyards on Mutation 4. Stumbled a little bit. It'll be a good watch. Uh -huh. um, hope everyone enjoys it. They'll have to tune in to find out how that one goes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you let us know that uh, you found the first one valuable, so we decided we're going to do a couple more of these. Please let us know if you want us to continue to do them and, you you know, you continue to find them valuable. Uh, I think we'll find the time to uh, get some more transparency out to the community. Um, on the next episode, we're going to be sitting down with our customer service team, uh, kind of deep diving into how they deal with bots and bans and you know player reports and things of that nature um, we're going to look right around you know what february is up to and then looking a little forward into march yep all right so we'll see you next time